And uh, thanks to those who were able to wake up this morning. I know that must have been a challenge. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, today I'll try to talk about Zabbix and also give you a practical demonstration of what it looks like. So uh, this time I wouldn't ask how many people are using Zabbix or how many know what it is. Usually it's that in this event uh, people have heard about Zabbix but they haven't really used it. Uh, so this time I decided that uh, it's, it's time to risk it and then try to show you how, what Zabbix actually looks like. Before we look at the Zabbix itself, uh, let's talk about briefly what Zabbix is. And uh, one thing which turned to be pretty important actually is that Zabbix is a true open source solution. So we don't have open core, we don't have enterprise version. Everything you get, that's the, the same version that everybody else is getting. And uh, <coughs> Nginx recently went open core and already many users complained. Uh, I think the Andreas talk uh, from yesterday was very enlightening on what can happen if you go open core. It's a, it's a risk always. So uh, we're not that. And uh, feel free to popularize this opinion. Uh, <coughs> recently had a Zabbix conference as well. And uh, there was uh, one moment which seems to be very related. So maybe if we can have that audio at this point. Sorry. Uh, let's, let's see whether... I can show you. I promise we, we, we have only one product, and our promise to our users is we are staying uh, open source. So uh, that was the main person behind Zabbix, Alexei, and uh, that's our public promise, so we're not going open core. We don't like it. Uh, Zabbix is also scalable. Uh, it's uh, working in several really large environments, and uh, I'll talk about that a bit more later. I'll try to give you some numbers as well. Uh, it is providing all the functionality in a single piece of uh, software, so you don't have to piece different things together yourself. Uh, but at the same time, it's also very flexible. You can uh, push custom data in Zabbix, and you can get data out of Zabbix in many different ways. You can open tickets and ticketing systems, so all the normal customization and expanding options that uh, most of you here are used to. Another slide from the Zabbix conference, and this is about the, uh, the automating things in a way. Uh, you might know that on the Google, on the YouTube, on the videos, they have a way to automatically give uh, subtitles to videos where they try to speech recognize you. This is person from Vienna and what they came up with was uh, and find out what sex was actually well aware. Obviously he did not say that. So sometimes the automatic thing might fail. And uh, he told me that uh, his father was the one who found this, this uh, subtitle thingy. Uh, Zabbix is also uh, becoming more popular, uh, and uh, this is quite happening quite rapidly. One thing is that it's pretty much the standard solution in Japan. Uh, we have lots of large users there, and it's fully translated to Japanese and all that uh, important things that are, are relevant for different markets. Uh, it's used by several of the really biggest companies in the world, and uh, this does help push us to work on the scalability. Uh, the bigger the environment that Zabbix is being used to today, the bigger it will be the one that will, it will be able to be used tomorrow. Uh, very, very brief history. So actually the solution is not new, it's uh, pretty mature. So uh, development initially started in 1998. Uh, then it was uh, provided publicly as an open source version in 2001. So that's like what, more than 13 years ago. Uh, in 2005, a company was founded to uh, provide services for it. It happened in Latvia, or Letland for this region. Usually when I'm talking to people from Germany, I say Latvia and then add Letland. If I do this, uh, if I talk to people from France, I add Letonie. If I talk to people from the USA, I add Europe. <laughs> uh, then uh, last year, we opened a branch in Japan which is slightly uncommon for companies from Latvia, or probably we are the first company from Latvia which expands to Japan directly. Uh, as mentioned, hey, Japanese like us. Uh, and now on to the risky part. Uh, but uh, before I do that, I'll have one question. Who came here to see how the practical demonstration fails? <laughs> one, anybody else? Okay, so we have one honest person in the room, that's good. Uh, practical demonstrations tend to fail. 
And one on my list of not to do for presentations, there's a like practical demonstration. That's number one. And uh, before I go on, there is another quick thing. Uh, most of you probably have seen this one. Dear mom, comma. <laughs> Fix ant. <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> Delete that. Delete that. I think it's picking up a little bit of echo here. Delete, select all. <laughs> so that was Windows Vista speech recognition uh, demonstration. I hope mine will not go as disastrously. I wouldn't need any audio anymore, thanks. So um, let's see, maybe mine goes a bit better. Uh, but uh, before we go on with the actual demonstration, let's take a look at uh, what the terms in Zabbix mean. Uh, also, for the demonstration, I wouldn't look at all the, the low-level stuff like installing it, getting it running, what the components are. Uh, I'll try to look at the actual usage of Zabbix from different aspects. And uh, before we go on with that, so in Zabbix, we have a term host. A host usually is a single server, single network device, or something uh, similar. Uh, then we have a term item. An item is a single data source. CP load, free memory. In this example, that would be CP load to begin with. Uh, in Zabbix, we have the threshold, the problem condition, totally separated from the uh, items, which are the data sources, and we call them triggers. So a trigger would be the one defining what a problem is. If the problem happens, we generate an event, and then a configuration entity called an action, the green one, has conditions, the gray ones. If the conditions match, then we, do, we perform some operation. When sending a message, obviously, we can easily include all kind of information, like the latest value from the item or lots of other things that I'll try to mention later as well. There's also a concept of temp doing templates. So you can uh, create configuration once and then apply it to a lot of hosts uh, easily in one go. And, uh, well, let's see how, the, how we could do that. Uh, this is the Zabbix front end interface, and uh, what I'm running right now is a virtual appliance, so that's easy to uh, use yourself as well without installing it manually. Uh, I will start by creating a new host. So I will click around the interface at this point. I'm creating a new host. Uh, let's say I'll call it in a very innovative way. Uh, Group a membership here. Uh, on the left-hand side are groups the host will be in, so I will add this host to the Linux servers group. And let's say I will use an IP address for this host as well. So far that was easy. I have a host, but this host is completely empty, so it's also fairly uh, useless. Uh, to gather any data on it, I would need at least one item. So that's what I'm going to create next. An item was a data source. So let's say I'll start with a simple thing again. So that's CPU load. Uh, for this item, I will be using a native Zabbix agent. I'm not showing you how to install it, how to run it, how, how it works. But we have, uh, we have native agents for many platforms, for pretty much all of them. And in this case, uh, native agent is already on this system, so that's what this item will be using. This is not a script or anything else that you have to run. An item key is a unique identifier which tells the, Zab uh, tell the, tells the Zabbix agent uh, how to obtain this data. Uh, so in this case, that's system CPU load, which is just an internal identifier. There's a decimal part, so I change the data type. And that's about it. I'm creating an item. I'll let this item collect data for a while. I will not look at it right now. We'll return to that in a moment. But uh, instead, uh, I will also start using templating system right away, which I'll benefit from a bit later. So on the template section, I'm creating a template. Let's say, again, extremely innovative name. I'm adding it to the templates group, so the groups the template or host is in are on the left-hand side. The available ones are on the right-hand side. Uh, this template is completely empty, so I could manually create a CPU load item again, but um, if I had lots of items like this, that would be quite a 
task and also more error prone. So instead, I can uh, copy entities around. So in this case, I can take the CPU load item, which I created on the host, and uh, I can copy it. Then I would choose the templates and the template that I just created. Uh, this can be done between hosts, between templates, but from host to template, like I'm doing right now, from template to host, that's not restricted in any way. So after copying it, I can see the details. The item was created, in this case, was created on the template. And now, uh, for this host, I will change the template linkage. So I will make this host controlled by the template, which was created initially. And uh, choosing the template, uh, which had the item also copied over from the same host. After updating the host properties, in the details, I can see that the CPU load item on the server host was updated. Uh, when items are updated this way, they don't lose any data, so anything that was collected before uh, would be still available in the database, still available for viewing and everything else. Uh, this allows to reconfigure template linkage easily. Uh, you have to think a bit about how you do it, obviously, but you will not lose the data if you do it properly. I have an item, I have a, uh, a template which is giving me uh, this item, and uh, now uh, I would like to create a trigger as well. I will do this on the template level. So a trigger was separate problem condition. In Zabbix, items only collect data, they don't care about what that data uh, contains. Good, bad, doesn't matter, it's some data, it's some values. And uh, when creating a trigger, I have to give some name to it as well, again, so something very simple like CPU low too high. Uh, then a couple of clicks later, I can find the item that I want to reference in this uh, trigger expression. And I can decide that if the value exceeds one in this case, then that will be a problem. Triggers in Zabbix, they use this uh, trigger expression language, uh, which in general is pretty simple, but uh, there's also a helper uh, as you saw before, where you can click around and it will generate the expression for you. This is an extremely simple expression. I'll try to mention later that there are some other more complicated options as well. In Zabbix, we also have six severity levels available for triggers. You don't have to use them all. Very often people coming from uh, different monitoring solutions say like two severity levels should be enough for everybody. Uh, we have six, you don't have to use them. You can say that in your environment, everything is only high and disaster. But recently we had uh, one company come and say, hey, can we have more than six severity levels? And we're like, no, not yet, but we'll think about that. So this one will be warning, CPU low to high, nothing very critical. Yeah, this one? Um, it's slightly specific, and it's uh, primarily meant for log file monitoring. In normal monitoring, if we receive values which are above our threshold, like in this example, if CPU load is above one, uh, we don't do anything after that. If we would enable this, any value arriving above the threshold of one would generate a new problem event. With a CPU load, that's maybe not totally useless, but not common to do. Uh, where this is useful if you're monitoring a log file and you are already filtering for problem entries in the file. So the only thing that you get is the problem records. You would alert on the first one, but then you would ignore the subsequent ones. So solution is to mark this checkbox, and then every new log value arriving would generate a new alert. And actually, I made a mistake here. I accidentally created this trigger on the host again, instead of the template as I intended. So now I'll try to fix it the same way as I did with the item by taking this trigger and copying it to the template. I hope that works. It did seem to work, and in this case, the trigger was created on the template, and now it was updated on the host. So the host one was linked back to the template. So it's totally okay to copy things around even if they would sort of overlap, and in this case, I copied something from a lower level to a higher level, and the higher level then sort of started controlling the one I was copying from, if that makes any sense in this morning. Uh, Zabbix also has user and user group concept, which we will explore in a bit more detail later, but for now, uh, what I want to do is I want to have 
a data collector, I want to have an alert or event in Zabbix terms, and then I want to send an email. To send an email, I need some recipient, so for that I need a user. I would now go to the user management and create a new user. Again, extremely innovative name. I will add this user to the Linux administrator group. It's slightly related to the host being in the Linux host groups group. And for this user, I will also add media. In Zabbix, media is a data source. Uh, sorry, not data source, but a way to notify the user. So in this case, uh, I will use an email. And I hope I, I can type this morning as well. So uh, this user will receive an email. Uh, on the media level, I can filter by the severity. I can filter by the time period. I'm not doing this at, at this time at all. This user will receive messages, at least based on media uh, settings, uh, always. So with the user uh, created, uh, this user currently has no permissions, because permissions also have to be assigned. And in this case, for the Linux administrators, uh, permissions have been set to the Linux servers. This is not the default, this is something I have done before. Normally, this user would not see anything at all. And uh, now that I have the host, I have an item, I have a trigger which would generate a problem event if something would happen. I have a user with media, with an email configured. I need one last thing which controls how people are notified, and that is something we call an action which is just a configuration entity. So I'm creating a new action here. Uh, actions may have lots of different conditions. This is something I will not do at this point. Uh, I will only leave in the default one. So if the host is in maintenance, don't do anything at all. Uh, there's lots of different possible conditions. So I could limit this action based on the application, which is a group of items. I can limit on the host group, on specific problem, on the severity, again, on the time period and some other things. None of that at this point. In the operations, again, I'll do something very simple. I will ignore all the advanced options. I will just add this single user as the recipient of the messages. Message will be sent right away when the problem happens, and I'm saving this action. So now I should have a fully working monitoring environment, monitoring one metric, having an alert on that, and hopefully also receiving messages on it. And let's see whether I can actually make the system do something extremely useful, which would generate a bit of load. Well, yeah, nothing more useful than this. So returning back to the slides a bit, yeah. I mentioned that in triggers, you are not limited to checking uh, just uh, the last value and so on. Uh, trigger expressions offer really a great flexibility. And uh, you can easily do uh, things like average over last 10 minutes. You can count the matching values of some time period. You can do deltas. You can do matching of strings in the incoming values. Uh, there's a large amount of uh, what we call trigger functions, which are the ones offering this functionality. There's also a possibility to use relative thresholds. So instead of having an absolute value, you can reference the previous item values. For example, I could get the average for the last hour, then compare that to the same hour or day, a week, two days ago, whatever you desire. Trigger may also check values from multiple items and also from multiple hosts. So at the same time, you can check things like the user count on the system and the CPU load. If, there's no user, uh, there, if there are no users on the system, then it's a problem if the CPU load is high. And all that is included in the base Zabbix distribution. This is a core functionality. Well, OK, core might be a bad word in this region now. Um, so it's included in the Zabbix server natively. It's not something you have to separately install or configure in any way. Uh, the notifications, I only added a single operation, which was sending a notification to the user, our recipient, when the problem happened immediately. But uh, Zabbix can do much, much more. It can escalate it can escalate to different users, to different user groups, like to management. 
Uh, you can base this on the acknowledgement status. So if the problem is not acknowledged, management either does not get the escalation message or it's delayed. Uh, you may also run automated commands. So uh, if a service is down, you can try to automatically restart it or you can gather information about the processes which are using the biggest amount of memory or anything like that. And of course, in the messages, you can provide all kind of useful information, like the last value from the item and so on. And um, one thing which you can include in messages is the escalation history. This is obviously not very interesting on the very first step of, in the escalation, but later on you can see who was receiving messages before I got this message. So this is something we usually suggest to configure for escalation to the management. Although when we uh, show this functionality to the management type people, they go like, oh, we absolutely have to use this. When we show that to more technical people, they go like, oh, we should hide that from the management. Because then everybody can see that, hey, you get an email at 3 o'clock in the night, right? Why didn't you react? Again, completely included, so uh, nothing custom needed. You just configure it the same way from the Zabbix front end or using any of the automated methods we will discuss later. Regarding the scaling, I promise to talk about that a bit more. And uh, on the Zabbix blog, there was recently an article which uh, talked about scaling up, and uh, the person was describing their experiences in a rather large company. So what they ended up uh, doing in production is gathering uh, 9,400 new values every second. So like CP load every new value, that's, that's one value like this, and they're gathering more than 9,000 of them. For each of these values, we are evaluating triggers, we are checking whether they're above any threshold, we are generating trends, which is long-term data storage for Zabbix, we are storing all that in database, and uh, more than 9,000 times per second. Uh, if you are more accustomed, uh, customized to uh, calculating per minute or per five minutes, then that's uh, 564,000 values every minute, or something below three million values every five minutes. So these numbers are pretty good, I would say. This is with Zabbix version 2.0. It's sort of included. Obviously, doing something like this is not I would do on my laptop here. Uh, that would be impossible, probably. Uh, but uh, with decent hardware, with decent fine-tuning, that is at least doable. We have an example of this. But, uh, yeah. Uh, for the backend, Zabbix uses database. We are supporting five databases, but uh, the most popular ones are MySQL and PostgreSQL. Uh, this was specifically done on MySQL, but it should be possible to do uh, to achieve similar levels on PGSQL as well. Uh, we have uh, unsupported but working branch of storing historical values in Cassandra. We plan to polish it and include it as a supported branch as well, uh, which should actually push this number way, way up if you would use Cassandra for historical values. But that's currently planned in the 2 to 2 branch. We have to first finish it and then work on that uh, Cassandra built-in support as well. And uh, even before Cassandra, we actually have several feature, uh, several performance improvements in 2 .2, upcoming 2.2. So the current branch is 2.0. We are working on 2.2 very hard. Uh, the person who did those 9,000 uh, something values per second with 2.0, they did test 2.2 already, and they were able to go at least three times that, maybe a bit more. But they said that they didn't have the time to investigate what happened after uh, ex ex increasing it up to three times. So um, let's return to the Zabbix frontend. And um, now we can check the uh, data that might be received. Uh, in Zabbix, when I create an item, I don't have to configure a graph for it or anything else. That's just automatically, automatically available. In this case, uh, I have only a single item. That's what I configured. So I can look at the graph. The graph is immediately rendered. So I don't have to pre-render them either or, or wait for it. Uh, and uh, in this graph, we can see that values were normal at first, and then I started to do some performance uh, affecting calculation on the host. The CPU load jumped, exceeded the 1, which was our trigger level, which is indicated by the line on the graph here. Um, there's a bunch of controls on the graphs that I will look at a bit later. Uh, but for now, uh, let's take a brief look at the event history. So in this case, uh, 
there's only one event, so the trigger went in the problem state, the problem event was generated. All the subsequent values above one, they did not do anything at all. And if I look at the list of triggers, or this is a list of problems in my current environment, that's one of my favorite views actually in Zebex because there's lots of filtering possible, which I will not show right now. Uh, I can see that there's one problem, it's not acknowledged, I could do that from this screen as well, uh, but for now I'll leave it as is. And let's see whether the last part of this also worked. Well, it did, I got an email. So uh, in this case, uh, it tells me that the CPU load is too high, there is the trigger severity, and a bunch of things which I'm not included, uh, I have not included in this case. Uh, for example, trigger URL was not configured, I didn't have multiple items in the trigger, and obviously I don't have escalation history either. So this shows that uh, getting up Zabbix up and running uh, just to have basic monitoring, basic alerting on the email should be relatively easy, well, if you know where to click at least on the front end. Uh, now that we know the basic things about how, how things interact in Zabbix, how they work together, um, a brief look at how you can gather network traffic, um, very brief look at the SNMP monitoring, uh, a bit more about the access rights that uh, are assigned to users, something we looked at before and the, from the configuration side, and uh, a bit about some uh, feature which is called low-level discovery in Zabbix or LLD. So if you ever see LLD in the Zabbix context, uh, that means low-level discovery. And back to the Zabbix interface. The uh, host I have, I only have one of them right now. I could obviously create the other one manually, but I can also uh, clone hosts in Zabbix. So if I'd like to manually add another one, I can just specify that it'll have a different name. And that's about it. I have two hosts now. Uh, to see the ben additional benefit of the templates, I will now work from the template, and I will create here additional items. And I would like to monitor network traffic, so I will use a dollar sign one representation here. The, in the item name, dollar sign one in Zabbix uh, expands to the item key parameters, which is the ones that you may specify in square brackets. And uh, let's say here I will monitor ETH one interface. Uh, this item, I will not convert it to bits, which would be easy, but I'll leave it at bytes per second. Uh, as the values we are getting originally from the uh, data source, they are counters, so we would get something I personally call a hill graph, which is only ever going up, up, up until the interface is restarted. Uh, I will change this to store value, and Zabbix is able to compute the difference between two values, how many seconds between them, and then store the difference in the database. And uh, to make sure that we see the values a bit sooner, I will also change interval to some low value, which is something I personally do not normally suggest, but for this demonstration should be just fine. And um, I will obviously like to see the outgoing traffic as well. So again, I can also clone items, not just hosts. And in this case, I have to change only two things here. The name should be more uh, relevant and net if in becomes net if out, which is another item key, uh, which is natively supported by the Zabbix agent. So again, this is all done by a C agent on the target system. Uh, agent is running on Windows, Linux, Solaris, IX, HPX, BSDs, probably pretty much anything you can, any Unix-like you can throw at it. Uh, the support of these items, it's all done without running commands, so we are parsing proc on Linux and doing some other magic on IX. I don't even know what we exactly we do on IX, for example. So it should be pretty well performing on the uh, monitored uh, host side. So I've cloned the item for the outgoing traffic. Now I have two of them. I chose ETH1 because uh, this system has very little traffic on ETH0, just to see that there's at least some value uh, coming out of that interface. Uh, so that's network traffic information that I'll try to look at in a moment. And uh, now, uh, a bit about SNMP. Let's say I will have an SNMP host. 
in the network device group, checking the same interface again. And in this case, instead of creating items on it manually, I will reuse pre-configured templates on Zabbix's side. For this demonstration, I actually have deleted most of them, so they don't really mess up the view. Uh, but uh, we have uh, maybe not a huge amount, but some amount of pre-configured templates. In this case, I will link the, the network device to a template, which should automatically discover all the SNMP interfaces on it. And obviously, I made a mistake. So uh, for SNMP to work, I need an SNMP interface. So Zabbix also supports multiple interfaces per host. You can monitor the same host using the Zabbix agent, uh, using SNMP versions 1, 2, C, and 3. Uh, you can add specific interfaces for JMX monitoring, and also IPMI can be monitored on the same host. So with the SNMP host added, I will let it collect data for a while, and we'll see whether that works. Uh, but now I will log out. Use, uh, what I had logged in as was user account called admin. This user account is similar to pretty much the root on the uh, Linux systems. And uh, now I will log in as the user that I created before. As you can see, the theme is different. So Zabbix Frontend supports theming as well. For my super user account, I had switched to the so-called classic theme, which I personally think is a bit less shiny, a bit less distracting. This user has a default one, which is more uh, brighter. And now, uh, if I look at the data collected, I only see the Linux servers group. I don't see the network devices, because that group is not uh, added as a as either read-only or read-write group for the Linux administrators. And uh, we can see that the network interface monitoring seems to be working on both of the hosts. I added two items on the template, and they were added on both of the hosts as well. Let's uh, leave this user account, and uh, let's return as the super user account. And uh, I hope it works, but let me check that. So in this case, the SNMP host, I only linked it to the SNMP interface discovery template. And uh, Zabbix has already discovered all the interfaces on it, ETH0, ETH1, and also LO for the loopback. This discovery natively is supported for any SNMP table. It's also supported on the agent level for network interfaces and for file systems. Uh, it can also be rather easily extended. We have users discovering databases, custom software components, and lots of other things. Uh, what I did here, I just discovered all the interfaces. I could have filtered them, so loopback, for example, could be excluded based on, based on regular expressions as well. So SNMP seemed to work. Lolo discovery seemed to work. Discovered all interfaces. Uh, Zabbix has several other built-in features. That is monitoring web pages. And we can also send any value to Zabbix. Let's take a look how that is configured. And uh, I could create the web, so-called web scenario on any of the existing hosts, but I will create a new host for this purpose. So it's up to me how I want to arrange these checks. So let's say I will have a host called OpenStreetMap. I will keep it in its own group. Nothing else required for this host at this point. But uh, now I will create something we call web scenario. Uh, these scenarios consist of steps. They can be more or less complicated. And uh, say here I will choose a more appropriate browser as well. <clears throat> For this manually created web scenario, I will keep things simple. So. I will have only one step checking the first page. That's about it. Uh, we will take a look at the results a bit later. Uh, if the Wi-Fi works, it, this should actually monitor some data about the web page already. Before we look at the results, uh, a bit about sending custom values to Zabbix. <clears throat> and, uh, 
This is done by an item type. So item types for like Zabbix agent, SNMP, uh, JMX, uh, IPMI. Did I mention that already? Uh, there's another item type which is called Zabbix Trapper. So on the template level, so that I get this on both of my hosts, I will create a new item which I will call customers in the shop. So this is something that Zabbix agent cannot monitor natively yet. Uh, but there are sensors to monitor how many people are passing them, so this could actually be implemented in Zabbix. Uh, the type must be a special Zabbix trapper, and key is something I can come up with myself. So that's the customer's key. Um, that seems to be about it. Although, one small change, I could also set an application for it. So application is not a software application in Zabbix, it's a way to group items. So in this case, I will name my application shop. With the trapper item created, I can send custom values to it. I can do that in several ways. One way is to use a command line utility called Zabbix Sender. I don't know whether that's readable, I hope it is. And I'm sending that to a specific Zabbix server and specifying a host. Then identifying the key, and sending the actual value. value. It said processed one failed zero, so that seems to be successful. Returning to the Zabbix frontend, if I check this item, awesome, the value I sent from the command line is in the Zabbix already. That is a way to send a single value. I can also send multiple values to multiple hosts from a file, from an input file. So in this case, I have in this file one item for each of the hosts, or one value for each of the hosts. In this case, I still have to specify the server name, or server IP, but then I only have to specify the input file. In this case, process two values, failed zero again, that's good. Returning to the latest data screen, I can see that for both of the items on two different hosts, the value has been updated. There's another way to do this. Uh, when I send the values like this, they're timestamped by the Zabbix server whenever it receives them. I can also send values from a file which are timestamped. So for each of them, a timestamp is included. That can obviously be sent to a single host, a different host. In this example, I will send the values to a single item. They will be timestamped. To do this, I specify additional flag, which tells Zabbix that this is not just from the file, but there's also timestamps in there. There's quite a lot of them in this file, actually. And there you go, we send a bunch of values. So in what was it, I don't know, less than a second, I send 43,000 values to Zabbix server. Uh, as this is running on a virtual machine right here on this laptop, this is not the most powerful system in the world. And if I look at the graph for the item for which I send these values to, all the values are not there yet, most likely. But if I set this to show the all period, we can see that, hey, this is how many values Zabbix has processed. The other ones are still in the caching system. They are being processed, they are be the trends are calculated, and everything else is being done. And then they are stored in the database. If I refresh the graph, I can see how the values are being put in the database. Zabbix frontend reads the data from the database and Zabbix server is putting them in the background right there. While it's doing that, uh, I can uh, briefly show that I can quickly switch from one time period displayed to another. And in this case, I have put there around one month of values in the uh, item. If I see some interesting peak or dip in the graph, I can drill down very easily by just zooming into that specific period of time. Or switch back to whichever I was looking at before. And while I was talking, all the values seem to be finally stored in the database. Let's see whether the web monitoring worked at all. So. I have the single scenario here, and it seems to be working. So we are now collecting information just about the first page, a single step on, uh, in the scenario. Uh, these are pre-built uh, included graphs. You don't have to use them. You can create your own graphs based on data received. Uh, you can create triggers on this data, and so on. Uh, this is also not that interesting because we have only a single step. 
If I had multiple steps, that would be a stacked graph. I could see uh, time, I could see the delay for each of them, and we could be able to tell that, hey, that step is really slow every now and then. Or if I look at the latest data, I can see that there's not only one or two values added per scenario, there's a bunch of them. In this case, the failed step is zero, so hey, everything was great. Obviously, clicking around for a large environment is not very feasible, so there are several methods how you can automate the configuration management in Zavix. Two of them, the most popular ones and probably the suggested ones, are XML and API. Uh, we support XML import export for some entities and API control for pretty much everything else. And uh, I have generated an XML file. I could have exported it, but uh, I generated that one from the scratch. And uh, now I can import it. So this generated file, and uh, let's see how that goes. That seems to have worked. If I expand the details, I can see that this uh, XML file contained a bunch of hosts, which were linked to the same template that I created initially. So for each of them, application, items were created, so everything was done. They were numbered. Now if I look at the list of hosts, and let's say I filter by the Linux servers, which is what I was importing, I can see that I have now, well, in total, there's a uh, hundred of hosts. So that is one way to uh, populate the configuration information in Zabbix without clicking around for, for a few months. Another way I mentioned is the API. And uh, Zabbix offers JSON RPC API. It's been uh, there for, for quite a while now. And uh, there are several ways to use it. There are a bunch of libraries for different languages. We have like 4.4 Ruby, 4.4 Python, 4.4 Perl. So you can choose your own. Uh, you can even use that with direct curl calls, which is, what exact, which is exactly what I will be doing. So I have a script to do this, and I hope it works. It does seem to work. And it's supposed to add the web scenario, which is slightly more complicated than the one I created manually. So now, if I look at the web scenarios for this host, there is the open street map. This is the one I created manually with a single step, checking one page, very basic. There's also the Zabbix front-end web scenario. If I expand the details of this one, I can see that it has five steps instead of one. And uh, so this was all created automatically without clicking around at all. How it's done, um, obviously I could show later uh, to somebody interested more details, but uh, the basic thing is that we are sending the JSON requests and getting back the responses. So we start by authenticating to the API because non-authenticated users will not have, at least by default, any permissions to create anything at all. Uh, then I am sending an application create request. Uh, this is semi-optional, but I decided that I will need a separate application called Zabbix Frontend for this. And uh, then based on the application ID, which I received back, this is the big blob which is creating the scenario itself. It's pretty unreadable at this point, but if I would format it uh, properly, it would be pretty readable. And the result was successful. I had a new web scenario added. I cannot really skip this information. Uh, so one thing to show is that Zavix is very flexible. You can put any data in it, and uh, what we are putting in it is the information about how many users we have on the Zabbix RC channel on Freenode. And uh, this shows a two-week period from, from, I don't know, a week ago or so. Uh, as you can see, we have a daily fluctuations. We are mostly European day, although the USA day is also uh, somewhat active. Uh, weekends are less active, and uh, we recently reached a new record high of 248 people in the channel, and uh, the average is pretty much hanging above 200 constantly, which is, I'd say, pretty great. And a uh, similar graph to show that Zabbix can store and graph data for a long period of time. This is a graph showing almost seven and a half years of the same values, that is the users in the IRC channel. As you can see, we started with uh, like what around, well, at least I have data from when the channel was around 20 people. It's been going up and down, up and down, but the general trend seems to be very positively upwards one. 
Uh, this graph was generated in 0.2 seconds right here. So, uh, okay, I was cheating a bit. It's already in the database cache, but still, a uh, seven-year graph shouldn't pose a large problem to Zabbix to generate. That is actually only a very, very small part of Zabbix, uh, what Zabbix can do. There's a bunch of other features, but uh, when we have a training course, we can't really fit all the features in one week. That's, that's how much you can do with Zabbix without installing plugins. So uh, I would like to invite everybody to try Zabbix out yourself. It's um, very easy to do. You can obviously install from distribution packages. We have great packages on Apple, for example, and not just that, on Debian and some other uh, distros. Uh, there's also Zabbix virtual appliance. So uh, if you don't want to install the packages or you don't have a server to do that right now, you can download the virtual appliance from the Zabbix web page. Uh, personally, I would suggest to wait a little bit because we have built the latest version for appliance. We just haven't updated all the links in the web page. So maybe wait till, I don't know, for, for the end of today and then grab 2.09, which will be the latest version in the download page. And uh, Right, so if you have any questions at this point. Please, one, one <laughs> moment, please. Uh, you, you showed a command for sending the, the values to, to Zebix, and uh, just out of curiosity, you, the, the options were minus Z for the server, minus K for the... Key. Ah, key, okay. Yeah, so I just dash S was for the host, which identifies the server in this case, and dash O was for the value. Okay. Obviously, we have a man page. You can use dash dash help. So well, it's it it's all there. It was kind of intuitive. So just what I, what I uh, yeah. Sure dash K to seems to be the most intuitive one. I would yeah. agree. Yes, <laughs> to do that. By the way, you can use the common line utility, but uh, it uses uh, sort of special protocol to send the values. But the protocol is extremely trivial. It's also documented. So we have uh, users who are not using the common line utility either because they don't want to or because, for, uh, because of performance concerns. They implement the protocol in their customer, uh, custom software and just send directly from their own software. Okay. And uh, maybe more seriously, uh, what I really, the sponta oh, sp spontaneously, what I really like is uh, that you, that you um, distinguish between triggers and items so that you, you can create events like this and that you have an API, but um, what I really are interested in is the graphic or the, the, the data base uh, behind the performance information. Do you plan to, to have an API or a way to feed this information to other uh, backends as well and read out of other backends as well? Or is it more bundled with Sabix that it's very hard to, to change? Uh, you mean the, the collected values, the historical yeah. data? Because I think 10,000 is nice, but um, at least for me, 10,000 uh, per second is not what I targeted. I targeted a lot more. So, uh, so as I mentioned, we, are, we have the uh, proof of concept Cassandra branch. Uh, we plan to not only make that one fully supported, but we also plan uh, to uh, implement a plugin structure for the uh, storage backends. So Cassandra will be just one plugin like this. We currently don't have other types planned, although we have feature requests for them. But I would assume they will come uh, at some point. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, in near future, Cassandra should come. Any other questions? It's a great chance to ask a question. <laughs> Got a lot of time. Ten minutes. One moment, please. Um, question to the to the dashboard or to the overview of the servers. Is it possible to generate some um, overview that I can sort for maybe a group of, of production server, a group of stage server, or maybe a group of, of web server or a group of application server that I can see there is a problem in this, that group. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are several ways to show data and filter problems, so uh, I don't have that much problems on this, that many problems on this system. Uh, but uh, one simple approach is to use this dashboard, which itself is not highly customizable. There are other views for this, but uh, there's a filter for it. So let's say if I enable the filter, I can choose and tell that, hey, I only want to see 
the most important host group for my personal dashboard. Uh, another way which I personally like because of its simplicity and the filtering capabilities as well is the monitoring triggers. Uh, so in this page I can see the currently active triggers. Right now I have only two of them resolved. So they will be shown here for a while, then they will go away. But I can filter it by uh, individual host or by host group. So if I want to see all the problems on network devices, I can do that. Uh, there's also a more advanced filter here. So uh, I can filter based on the acknowledgement status. I can show events for all the problem. I can filter by the minimum severity. So maybe I want to see all the problems that are not acknowledged, which are more serious. I can filter by the age. This might seem a bit strange at first, but we have some customers uh, for whom the standard operating principle is that somebody is always looking at the Zabbix interface. If the problem happens, they work on it. They, if they cannot fix it in a couple of days, it does not have to stay up there. So they hide problems which are older than some period of time. Uh, and I can filter by name as well. Let's say if I only want to see all the CPU load to high triggers in this specific host group. Uh, this and similar views, I can also include them in something called screens. And the screen is a collection of different entities. Uh, I probably should not go into this too much, but uh, to a screen, I can add lots of different things. So it's a cell-based configuration. So it's a table. And to each of the cells, I can add lots of different elements. So I could show, let's say, a bunch of graphs showing router traffic at the top. Then I could show a list of the currently active problems for a specific uh, host group or for a specific host or for all of them. Um, so there's um, a fair amount of customizability for how you want to show the problems and maybe filter them. OK, any more questions? Mm, no. <laughs> OK, then. So if no, yeah? <laughs> That's just to get you woken up in the morning, like <laughs> running back and forth. And the API you showed is not only for configuration, I suppose it's also for getting values out of Zabbix? From the API, you can get currently historical information, event information, acknowledge data, and all that. Uh, what uh, one maybe major thing you cannot get out currently is the trend data. So for that, you have to dive into the database at this point. That one definitely will come. I just cannot tell when exactly. Okay. But history events and all that is possible right now. So you, one can script around that you do not have a plug-in for other backends by using the API and read all the information, dump it to another backend? You could, but probably if, the, if you want to do it on a large scale, then they, raw database access will be faster. Okay. Because uh, through the API, that's another layer. Mm -hmm. uh, so. OK, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious to see if, uh, could you apply, like, if you install the agent on a host, could you apply the, all the checks that are available for that specific host in the system without applying a template or something? Well, like, you can like, all, yeah. like check and K does it. Let's say if if you know the system, check and K. You Probably not well enough. <laughs> so the the whole idea is that you can just inventorize the host and it will detect all the available. Uh, services and uh, type of checks that are that could be active in the system mm -hmm. uh, well personally I prefer more more strict approach where something like puppet chef or whatever would feed Zabbix this information through the API because they know what is supposed to be running on the system not what cur what's currently running but uh, what you can do is use a feature we call active agent auto registration so an agent which is connecting to the server we call them active this is from the agent perspective always so a passive agent sits and waits for connections. Active agent connects to the server. When an active agent connects to the server, it sends a bunch of information. And you can use uh, substring matching to link to templates automatically on the Zabbix side. OK. OK. So and for Puppet, you mentioned Puppet. Uh, you just mean like Puppet uh, doing a, a configuration and setting up, uh, up some nodes, and that's how to deploy the agents and configuration yeah. templates. And yeah, it seems to be fairly popular, and I would say a very, very sane approach, where uh, you have the, the configuration management system or system management tool deploy the system, install whatever components are running there, then it knows about that, goes to the Zabbix API, creates the host, links to the templates. Uh, later, if the role changes, it can unlink from some templates, link to other, and so on. Okay. 
and also do you support something like uh, NACA and NRP and stuff to send to Zabbix? So we don't NACA. officially support that, but there are uh, the community contributed wrapper script at least for some of those. I, I can't really tell you for which ones exactly, but at least one there is a wrapper script, so you can use some of those. Okay. Do you support agents also for AIX or some The other? Zabbix agent, it can natively run on IX, on HPX, Solaris, okay. BSDs, Windows, mm -hmm. Linux. Uh, so pretty much any Unix-like system should work. On some more exotic ones, there might be some slight issues getting it to compile, but if so, then we consider that a bug, so let us know, we will eventually fix it. Okay, so there's a source, so you can just compile also. Of course, we are GPL2, uh -huh. so I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's full open source, true okay. open source, no open core. Remember about that, it's important. <laughs> okay, thanks. No problem. Just to mention that if you want to compile on something like on IX, uh, then that might be a bit of a challenge. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he can stay here, it's good. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> well, there. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, there's a. <laughs> Uh, the items you, you collect graph uh, performance data, it's all about performance data for me, um, and the retention times and the storage uh, durability, is it configurable or do you...? It depends, uh, pr pretty much it depends on the size of the system. If the system is not huge, then it's configurable per individual item. So you can keep this data for a week, this for one day, this for a year, whatever. If the system is really large, then you have to partition the tables, otherwise the delete statements would really not be very quick. In that case, it all ends up being the same for all the items. Okay, the bigger you get, you get this, the, the more... Or the, the, the well, there are like two, two levels. Now? At some point, you're pushing so much data in database that it cannot really keep up with removing all data. Okay. So then you have to partition it because dropping a partition is a way cheaper operation than doing a delete of, of many, many values. Okay. But you can, can you say for one item that you do not want to collect the, the historical data? Is it yes, you can set that to zero as well. Sure, okay. you can do that. But for Although, on the other hand, then why would you do that? And maybe you do not care about the historic data because you only care about now, let's say. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Theoretically, you could do that, yeah. Okay. And for how many hosts do you think it's, it's sane to use Sabix? 1,000, 5,000? It heavily depends on how many items you're monitoring on each of them, what the intervals are, what the retention periods are. We have some environments where they're monitoring somewhere around 100,000 hosts. Obviously, in those environments, they're rather simple, like maybe two items per host. But still, mm -hmm. it does scale to that level. Okay, okay. Cool. And there's over there. The last question I <laughs> we're Thank you. Um, you mentioned having your own agent. Um, I've been aware generally of the fact that you have your own agent. Um, just a curiosity question, development effort-wise, how much time does Zabbix spend working on the agent versus working on the rest of the platform? Uh, that's hard, maybe not that much, I would say. Uh, because the agent is fairly capable already. Uh, most of the time we have to spend on the agent is fixing something on Solaris where there's like non-continuous non CPUs and then that's strange or that we didn't expect. Uh, although we do have uh, people coming in and saying that, hey, I want the agent to support this feature or that feature. Uh, if I would have to make a wild guess, I would probably say overall maybe 10%. But that obviously also changes a lot. In some, in some uh, major releases, we work on the agent a lot because there's like, uh, there was a company which wanted like 20 new items in the agents, and then we, we have to spend some time on that. Uh, but overall, I would estimate something like that. So as you mentioned, that's probably the last question. Okay. And I'll just mention that if anybody has any additional questions, feel free to catch me later. I'll, I'll be hanging around uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, definitely do come to the Zabbix channel on the free node. It's a really great place with the advanced Zabbix users hanging out there. Even if you don't have the questions, you can come to me. Uh, I have some Zabbix pens and Zabbix stickers and, and so on. So, yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks for waking up.